we are beginning a series that uh, starts with Genesis and uh, in that previous uh, study that we had we looked at the earlier stages of Genesis but today we're going to have a look at the life of Judah and of Joseph all the J's who were in that family Jacob as well but the book is actually the book of Genesis is very well put together when you have a quiet look at the sectionising of the story it's brilliantly told it's probably true that if you ask a lot of people that used to go to Sunday school where some of their preferred lessons came from you'll probably find that the stories in Genesis have stuck very well compared with probably most areas of the scriptures other than the gospel writings what made up this man Joseph where did he come from how was it that in the family that Jacob had he had 12 children and he was the second last but how was it that his accomplishments his notoriety his achievements his remarkable skills were so powerfully illustrated in the personage of Joseph more than any of his other brothers there's a lot of ability in his brothers the whole lot of them have got skills they're a very enriched family in many ways but Joseph is the outstanding person and the question then comes to us well in 12 children how is it that one becomes so outstanding and has had that reputation for well for thousands of years let's come to Genesis chapter 37 Genesis 37 is the introduction really of his life these are the generations of Jacob it says in 37 and verse 2 Joseph being 17 years old so you see that even telling the story although he's certainly not the oldest of the children one of the probably the second lady second uh, youngest of the children yet he's the first mentioned in verse 2 Joseph being 17 years old was feeding the flock with his brethren and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah his father's wives and Joseph brought unto his father their evil report that is they were playing up some distance away from the, from the uh, tent of the family and uh, some of the brothers became reported on <laughs> I suppose by Joseph now it says in verse 3 balancing this record out now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because his, he was the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colours which you're all very familiar with from Sunday school and when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him this is not an easy start is it for a young man that's uh, making his early strides in his family the next section sort of puts us into midstream you might say verses 5 through to the end of verse 10 there's an account of how dreams were given to him two dreams you know my dear brothers and sisters this is an amazing book those two dreams from verse 5 to verse 10 are the framework of his life if you ask yourself the question what was it when Joseph was in the prison Potiphar put him in the prison it got worse he was then 
in the prison of the prisoners. But what was it when he was in that place? Knew no one, done nothing wrong. This woman had got him and he ended up in the prison. But what was it, my dear brothers and sisters? Late at night, in dark Egyptian prison that helped him to be able to hold on to the things he knew from his childhood. What was it? That's why this, is, this framework is put in here at the beginning, verses 5 to 10. It's those two dreams, there's others to come, several pairs of dreams. But these are the two, and they're set that way, aren't they? Much as to say, well, here's the life of Joseph in figure. Because that's what they were. And there isn't any shadow of doubt, is there? I mean, what else did he have? There's no radios and televisions all the rest of it we have in our world today. Books, of course, scarce as hens do. So what's going to keep his fire of faith going in such a strange environment? When even when he did a great job in Potiphar's house, Potiphar was, he thought he was the antipans. Everything was spotless, everything was done, easy to get on with, very honest person, cooperative, and extremely skillful. Absolutely reliable. What more could you ever want? And then his wife played a trick on him. She thought he was good looking too. And so she wanted his company. And so she arranged in a very devious way to incorporate into some suspicion. So he ended up in the prison. So you're sitting in the prison that night and thinking, well, whatever did I do today that was wrong? And as the hours ticked by, you come back to the, to the, the, the dreams. That's what you do. You've got no other magazines. You've got no other books. But what you have got is that dream that came to you and told you about your sheath was lifted up against the sheaths in the field of your brothers, your mother, your father. And they bowed down, those sheaths bowed down. And you think, well, it doesn't like, seem to me that the first chapter's too close to the record. I was promised that there would be some sort of superiority among my family. Where are my family? They wouldn't know where I was. Paid for tuppence, gone into Egypt. And they have brothers themselves, and most of them are probably glad that he's gone. I won't have this competitive character around the place, and some of us always excelling, or has a favour of dad. Or it may have been the other one, the second dream he had. Does that give any inferences as to why he is now where he is? He dreamed yet another dream and told it. His brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more, and behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. What's that got to do with being a dark Egyptian bedroom, totally strange to you? How do you fit that in to the details? So few details, aren't they? It, but it's those that formed the framework of his faith. The more you think about that thought, the more it intrigues you about the mind of Joseph. He's a deep thinker. 
And he doesn't give up on the first call. And he doesn't discard it because he believes that the God of Israel had given those dreams. None of the family had them, but one came and then the other came. So sort of pairing up, they kind of told the same story. Even mother was involved in the story. If we slide over to the next column in our same Genesis chapter 37, you begin to sort of see a little bit of what life was like in Jacob's family. Israel said unto Joseph, verse 13, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Which was quite a way away from Hebron, where their usual residence was. Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Well, it's in 30 k's away. That's a long way. Come and I will send thee unto them. And he said to him, to him here am I. And I'd like you just to underline that. He was willing. I don't think he wanted to go. None of them were too nice to him, as far as we can estimate. Perhaps Reuben, the girls did. He might have been a little bit more charitable when things weren't going too good for Joseph. But no one was really that thrilled about him. And you would have thought that Joseph might have said to his head, Oh, Dad, they don't want to see me. They give me a hard time when, when they're here. Why do you want me to go? What am I going to do? None of them talk to me. None of them are nice to me. None of them really want me to be there. How am I going to manage that? I pray thee, see whether it be well with thy brethren. Very positive requirement. And well with the flocks. And bring me word again. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron and he came to Shechem. You know that report never came, did it? The father's request was, and bring me word again, underline it, because it's pointless. You can go right now to the end of the story of Jacob and Joseph and you realise that that story about the report never got there, did it? Because in a very short time he was off to Egypt and he was there for years. And the report of Jacob's stock and circumstances became totally irrelevant. But it's an interesting little phrase. And bring me word again. He would have liked to, I suppose. It was better than what the alternative might have been. Now it sketches in a couple of other little items here. Verse 15. And a certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What seekest thou? Everything's up and down, isn't it? Did you notice that? Who's this man? We don't know. A certain man found him. I wouldn't be surprised if that was one of God's messengers. It's a long way to go for a single boy from Hebron to Shechem. A certain man was found, found him and behold, he was wandering in the field. Wandering in the field. He was moving around and uh, seemed to have a mission. His face was down, he was thinking, trying to sort something out. They didn't know quite what to sort out or where to go with it. Which direction did he go? Was he going out there to find out the, the situation of his brother's cattle and sheep? Well, he, he's dithering, he's not quite sure as to what to do. It's all like that. And the man asked him, saying, What seekest thou? 
He said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks. Now there's a man in the middle of a great big paddock, spreading lands on either side. And somebody asked him what he's doing. And he said, I seek my brethren. See, that's not ordinary, is it? But it is nevertheless in agreement with the rest of the picture, which says in verse 16, I seek my brethren. And that's why we make that the title for this summary of Joseph's life. So it could be other equally good summaries, but that's very interesting, isn't it? Every time he's asked something, he's willing to do it. You would have thought that there's good reasons to say to Dad or Dad, I'm not terribly good at that stuff anyway. Have you got something like a bit more academic or something a bit more we can chat about or something? But he didn't. He was willing to go with his brethren. He was a, a positive contributor to the environment of his family. So he went after his brethren and found them in Jotham. There's a third little expression. He went after his brethren. There's three of them there, isn't it? And each one is saying, Joseph is in favour of the family life. He is interested in his brothers. He wants to be part of them. Notice that. Very carefully written, isn't it? That's why he was dithering in the field. He didn't know what to do, did he? He was unsure as to how to manage this matter. Perhaps the brethren have gone further away. This man told us, he said, I overheard that they were, they were going to Dothan. That's another 30 case. You can see why he was having a good thing about the country. Very difficult circumstances. Well, we know what happened. And he was picked up by the traders that came through the land and were on their way to Egypt. And uh, the brothers had uh, put him down a hole in the ground and left him. And they had uh, nice stewed meat and vegetables and he was in the, in the dungeon. But uh, one of them particularly had a, a bent in finance and he thought was, it's not a good thing, you know, to, you've got a product there you can sell. These men passing through, that's what they're all about. You sell something to them and you get something back. I mean, if you just left our brother in the hole, then there's no profit in it. Poor Judah, he was born with that as a possession. And so our Joseph ends up in Potiphar's house. And he does everything he could. What's he going to do? Whatever it does he do, he believes in God. No question of that. But what does he do? This is your room. Uh, Joseph and uh, I want you to keep it clean and the regulations for your duties here as here and so on. He took it all in. Yahweh was with Joseph it says in verse 2 and he was a prosperous man and he was in this house of his master the Egyptian and his master saw that Yahweh was with him. His master saw that Yahweh was with him. And Yahweh made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Now apparently it was so darn well done that you could just look at the place after a short time and you could see that the neighbours have been left behind. This young man's got the place really purring. It's extremely well kept and the product's coming, everything is in order. So the people looking over from the next door neighbor's property, they said, you know, since that young fellow's come, that place has just gone ahead like a rock. 
empty. His master saw that Yahweh was with him. His master saw that Yahweh was with him. How amazing is that? Who said this prophet for you anything about the God of Israel? But somehow he seems to have become aware, and this happened several times in the life of Joseph, that people find that around him things go well. There's something about him that is unusual. Things prosper under his care. And they loved his attitude too. He was bright, he was happy. He didn't have any friends. No brothers and sisters to talk to. No mail to get from the letterbox. You know, at least perhaps once a month. No mail at all. He's by himself, an isolated man. And he did everything he could. Came to pass, verse 5, from the time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, that Yahweh blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And if you put it like that, my dear brothers, it seems, doesn't it, that it was obvious that was the case. All the other properties were there, they're going on like they did last year. But this one, it's really booming. And all that he had in the house and in the field was doing well. And his master was very happy with it all. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, complete confidence. And he knew, he knew not, rather, all he had. In other words, he didn't look at the books as if he didn't check out the things, because every time he did, Joseph had everything covered perfectly. So what's the use of spending time, time like that? He probably spent a bit more time out on the golf course or something. He was very, very happy. However, his, his wife thought that Joseph was a pretty special young man, and she attempted to lie with him. She made all the opportunities and when that didn't work then she tried to do it virtually physically. And of course we know the story that he left his garment behind and she took that to Potiphar and that ended up in him being placed into the prison. So we read in verse 20 Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison a place where the king's prisoners were bound. And he was there in the prison. Now if you were Joseph, what would you try to work out from that? Is that helpful to my cause? I believe what God said. I do believe that. That I'm going to be honoured in a special way with gifts or advances improvements in my circumstances that will make me more wealthy and more readily recognisable than any in my family. But I've done the best I could possibly have done and here I am, friends. However, Yahweh was with Joseph 21 and showed him mercy and gave him favour in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. <laughs> Here's this little 18 year old in this prison, doesn't know any of these people, they're all senior people in quite high positions in life. And who's the boss around here? Who keeps charge of the place? Verse 23, the keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand. Just like Potiphar thought. You don't have to worry about the details when this young man's there. Because Yahweh was with him. Now it says that in verse 21 and it says that again now in verse 23. And again we ask the question, the lights off, it's the middle of the night. What is that young man thinking about? He hasn't got any books. What's he thinking about? 
Well, he has got a good memory. And all the things that came from grandpa, great grandpa, in the stories of God working with them, he knows those stories. Yes, he does. But those stories didn't relate personally to him. God hasn't done this to make it difficult for me, but God has got some purpose in this. Why am I among all these prisoners, most of them well off, good positions in life? Perhaps that will give me a leg up. And some way out of this situation might be found. You can see, can't you, why the dreams were given first. Dreams are quite specific. They only need, you know, two lines to, to state what they what they are telling. Very simple. So your mind does all sorts of, <laughs> of travels to try and work out what it is that the God of Israel, Yahweh, Jacob's, my father's God, Abraham's God. But how does that fit into my life? So it just so happened then that two very important uh, members of the leadership of Egypt were put in to the prison. The butler of the king of Egypt, 40 verse 1, he was one and uh, the other was the one that did the baking. They were put in ward in the house of the captain of the guard into the prison, verse 3, the place where Joseph was bound. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them, and they continued a season in ward. It's the same story, isn't it? He's got all these senior people with considerable status in life, and he's put over all of them. And he does it so well, they don't even bother to check on anything that happens. Well, he asks them of their circumstances, and they both said, well, we've, we've just had a dream. You had a dream? Yes. And you've had a dream. And they said unto him, we have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto them, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me them, I pray you. He's very sharp, isn't he? Joseph is very sharp, very clear. He can see that those two chaps have worked out themselves that that wasn't accidental. They got the same, on the same night, they got a dream that meant much the same thing. The story was the same. They both got that dream. Woke up in the morning and spoke to their, their good friend. He said, Oh, you know, I had a dream last night. The other one said, Oh, yes, I did. Well, you would start to think, wouldn't you? And then if you moved around the prison, I bet you'd hear that, you know, that young fellow, he's really quite unusual. And he talks about things that others don't talk about, but my word, he keeps this place wonderful and you can, you can trust him. And so the two dreams were given. There was the cupbearer and there was the, uh, the one that did the cooking for the, for the prison. Well, within three days shall Pharaoh, verse 13, lift up thine head and restore thee unto thy, thy place, and thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand after the former manner when thou wast his butler. But think on me. Now this is interesting. Joseph now gets more open in his request. But think on me when it shall be well with thee and show kindness please, I pray thee, unto me and make mention of me unto Pharaoh and bring me out of this place, this house. Well, what he said about what would happen to either of them did happen. And so the butler was continued to be employed in Pharaoh's house, 
and the other one lost his life. Verse 22, he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them, yet did not the chief but remember Joseph. So is that a letter? Well, you can imagine that Joseph would be really thinking about the dreams that he had, two dreams again. They're turning up now. And in a short time, he's in front of Pharaoh himself. Because eventually the butler woke up and said, oh, look, I've, I've done the wrong thing. A good mate of mine, he told me what my dream was. Really? So Joseph was dressed up and then he came to speak before Pharaoh. So in very short time, he now has actually made acquaintance with Pharaoh. What an amazing circumstance that was. Everyone would have thought, never seen progress, advancement like that in my life. Freak boy. And it's only a, a short number of days or hours almost that in fact Pharaoh has a dream. Two dreams. Again, it's a pair. And they're desperate to know what they mean. And the butler remembers that he hasn't given the good report about Joseph. And so he gives the report, and in comes Joseph, all dressed up to meet Pharaoh. And the next minute he finds that he's been put over the reassembly of the organisation for food for Egypt. Now, brothers and sisters, when he went to sleep that night, I think that Joseph would begin, begin to say, I can see what those dreams that I had at home, two dreams here, two dreams there, my two dreams, God is working. Whatever I might have thought, when I just went out by my cold self, I can see that God is working. And I'm now in a position one could never have believed that it could be so good as well. I have found it to be. Well, uh, there's many further steps in that development. There was uh, dreams about seven good years and seven bad years. And this young man was put over the appointment of distribution of food through Egypt in that period of time. The consequence of that is that his own family felt the, uh, the pressure. Back there in Israel, the seasons were poor and the family of Jacob were finding the pressure until they decided that they'd have to do what other people were doing and, and go down to the only place that had food and that was Egypt. And we know, of course, what happened. But it took some time to do that and several trips to do it. I'd like us to have a look at chapter 44. This is when Judah speaks of repentance. Now Judah was the tough one and he was also famous for his irresponsible behaviours. There's a whole chapter, chapter 38, which speaks about his misdemeanours in that kind of way. And he's very tough. He's interested in money and he really didn't care one iota about jo Joseph, but now he does. Why? Because things are grim. So we read in verse 18 in chapter 44, Judah came near unto him and said, O oh my Lord, he's speaking to his brother. Let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word in my Lord's ears. There's a miracle taking place. And let not thine anger burn against thy servant, for thou art even as Pharaoh. Look how he put it. So deep was the problem that the family had for food 
They called people by the best names they could ever think of. My Lord asked his servants, verse 19, saying, Have you a father or a brother? And we said unto my Lord, Who's the my Lord? That's Joseph. We have a father, an old man, a child of his old age, a little one, and his brother is dead. And he's standing in front of him. And he alone is left of his mother. And his father loveth him. And thou saidst unto thy servants, Bring him down unto me. My dear brothers and sisters, can you imagine the impact of all that? This tough nut older brother that would uh, balk at nothing. And now he's calling Joseph his Lord. Joseph could clearly see that God was in his life. Things that just don't happen were happening time and time again. This is a beautiful section of Judas of uh, Joseph's life. Thou saidst unto thy servants, verse 23, except your youngest brother come down with you, ye shall see my face no more. And it came to pass when we came up unto thy servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord, the words of Jacob his son, of Joseph his son, and our father said, go again and buy us a little food. The problem was, of course, that dad didn't want to let go of Benjamin, the youngest. And so Judah, that was such a, a self-interested person, is now brought to pleading for the younger brother and pleading in the face of his second younger brother. What an incredible, what a remarkable thing that is. And Joseph knows it all along because he, of course he knows who they are. And they're telling him what they've been saying to their dad back at the farm. This was very, very heartening news, wasn't it? For Joseph, he knew that things were well on the way in developing God's purpose. And so we read in the last little section of that, it shall come to pass, verse 31, when he seeth that the land is not with us, that he will die. And thy servants shall bring down the grey hairs of thy servant, our father. By the way, they were Jacob's favourite words. The grey hairs of thy servant, our father, with sorrow to the grave. This is the sketch of Judah's words to his brother. And his brother would have picked all those words up with tremendous feeling. The image is given of his little brother Benjamin. The grief and the concern of his much loved father. And he can see the hand of God is right behind all of this now. For thy servant, verse 32, became surety for the lad. That's what Judah now accepts as his role. Unto my father, saying, If I bring him not unto thee, then I shall hear the blame of in my hear the blame to my father forever. Now therefore I pray thee, let thy servant abide instead of the lad a bondman to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brethren. It's just astounding. Now Judah's prepared to take the place of Benjamin. And Benjamin can go, but Judah will remain. That's, that's an enormous shift. God is truly working. So, more and more we can see that when he saw his brethren in the beginning, it eventually took him into situations that were just remarkable, absolutely remarkable. And through all of that, Joseph has such a remarkable disposition. For all the 
they had done to him. He gave them every opportunity to clear the way. It's over in chapter 46, when uh, Israel, that is, when the father, verse uh, 28 of the previous chapter, when uh, Jacob is putting the whole situation together, he says, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet here, and I will go and see him before I die. What a transfer of mind, heart, of spirit, this is. And now the older father, he must have been at this stage something like about 112, 20 or something in, in years, and he's now prepared to go down into Egypt to meet Joseph. Well, we can't, we can't measure that, can we? Life's too comfortable and easy. So, so easy to get what you want, whether it's on this or the phones, or whatever it is, everything's easy to get. But in those circumstances, that is most remarkable verse indeed. Israel took his journey with all that he had. He knew he wasn't coming back with all that he had. And came to be a Sheba and offered sacrifices unto the God of his father Isaac. That's a lovely verse, isn't it? That's where where Abraham made some of his covenant relationships with the people that were round about. And now all of the family have come to Beersheba, the well of the oath, and offered sacrifices unto the God of his father Isaac. Verse 2, And God spake unto Israel in the visions of the night, and said, Jacob, Jacob, and he said, Here am I. And he said, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will make thee a, of thee a great nation there. I will go down with thee into Egypt, and I will also surely bring thee up again, and Joseph shall put his hand upon thine eyes. So now the father is encouraging the children to accept the circumstances that are coming. They're now doing all the things that have been determined through the life of Joseph. And Jacob rose up from Beersheba, verse 5, and the sons of Israel carried Jacob their father and their little ones, their wives and the wagons, which Pharaoh had sent to carry him. Pharaoh sent a lot of goods and so on back to the family as much as they might need until they could pack up, get to Egypt. They sent them in some Egyptian wagons. When uh, Jacob looked out of the window, he saw these wagons and he thought, they're not made out here. They're Egyptian wagons. And that's how he knew that this was no fraud put up by the other sons. This was a true representation of uh, Egypt in their lives. Now, my dear brothers and sisters, that uh, story is a most moving story. We have had, we've had mountains shifted in terms of the attitudes of people and the positions they have with others. And the, the work of God is becoming more and more powerful as they see that. But can you imagine then going down past Beersheba, which is quite down the south, isn't it? And then you go from there to Egypt and you come to Goshen, which is sort of the first town as you're going into Egypt. Flat country, 